One of the most interesting types of exoplanet theorized to exist are ocean planets. While there aren't any confirmed examples yet, there are many candidates. And these planets, if they exist, would be several times the size of Earth, and have oceans of water hundreds of miles deep. Compared to Earth's oceans, which are only a few miles deep, you can probably see how this would be a very interesting environment for a planet to have. You could have planets with oceans so deep the bottom layers are compressed into a solid form of hot ice, or planets almost entirely made of water by mass, or cold planets covered in ice shells like Europa or Enceladus on steroids. Some of the exoplanets you may have heard of before, like Kepler-22b, have been proposed to be ocean planets like this. There's LHS-1140b, which potentially has an ice shell and nitrogen-rich atmosphere if recent James Webb observations are accurate. And there's GJ-1214b, officially named Anipotia, which is named after a word that literally means large body of water in the Ma language. Anipotia specifically will be important for this video. Of course, when you hear ocean planet, one of the first questions you likely have is planets like these could be habitable. That question is beyond the scope of this video, but I have talked about it in others. Essentially, I believe that it may be possible for some of these planets to be capable of supporting some kind of life, but I'm much more pessimistic about the idea of life forming there. We don't really know how life on Earth started, but the evidence we do have suggests it may have required volcanic activity in some capacity. Because these planets are so different compared to Earth in composition, they may have a complete lack of volcanic activity, or completely different types. For example, hydrothermal vents, which are very important for Earth life, may not exist. So I don't think life will have an easy time forming on these planets, if it's even possible at all. These planets could also have extremely dense atmospheres, so dense it becomes unclear where the ocean ends and atmosphere begins, and it all mixes together. Most of these planets would be much closer to ice giants in structure than rocky planets, which is why they're usually called mini-Neptunes. But anyways, that may not even matter, because a recent paper suggests that many of our water world candidates are actually unlikely to be ocean planets at all. Even worse, they suggest that ocean planets, as explained above, are actually unlikely to exist based on what we know about planet formation, and are actually more likely to be carbon planets. And a second paper suggested that a few planets we know of are consistent with being carbon-rich soot planets instead of ocean worlds. The planets we'll be looking at specifically are TOI-270d, the aforementioned Anipotia or GJ-1214b, and the infamous K218b, the planet everyone briefly went crazy over for potential signs of life. So we'll first go over why many ocean planets may be more likely to be soot planets instead. Then we'll go over these three planets and see if what we know about them is consistent with them actually being soot planets instead of ocean worlds. First, why we thought many of these planets were water-rich. The most common type of exoplanet we've discovered is a planet between the sizes of Earth and Neptune. These planets can be super-Earth's large rocky planets, mini-Neptunes, smaller versions of ice giants that include water worlds, and small ice giants. Some of these planets have very low densities for their size. For example, K218b is about 8.6 Earth masses, about halfway between Earth and Neptune, and 2.6 times Earth's radius, giving it a density too low to be made fully of rocks, but too high to be made mostly of gas. This is true of all the planets we'll cover in this video. When planetary systems form, they have large amounts of both rocky and icy material. We have objects in the solar system with compositions that are 50% water, ice, or more and water has a lower density than rock. So we have planets that are too big to be made fully of rock, but too small to be made fully of gas, so the obvious solution is that they must be made of liquid. This was the assumed solution for the low densities, and most of these planets must have large amounts of icy material, like water. And since most of these planets are pretty close to their stars, with K218b being in a habitable zone, most of this icy material could be in the form of liquid water. So, as you can see, there wasn't actually any compelling evidence that these planets were ocean worlds. The ocean world explanation was assumed to explain their low densities. But now, a recent paper has proposed a different explanation, soot planets. This explanation is based on what we know about how planetary systems form. Essentially, they suggest that any planet that forms with a large amount of water should also form with a large amount of carbonaceous material, such as organic carbon compounds, more commonly known as soot. As much as 40% of the planet's mass could be comprised of soot in this case, pushing the amount of water to well below 50% of the planet's mass. This would make these planets have a very similar composition to solar system comets. These soot planets could explain many low-density planets with or without the presence of water. So you could get dry soot planets, which have very little water, in a composition of about 75% rock and about 25% soot. Or you could get soot water planets made of 55% rock, 25% water, and 20% soot. The different compositions depend on where the planets form. 
The snow line, or ice line, or water line, or whatever you want to call it, is an area around a star where water will be cold enough to freeze, allowing it to be used to form planets. This is why the further away you get from the sun, the more icy objects you see in the solar system, and why almost every single large solid object past Ceres has a subsurface ocean made of water. However, there's multiple lines where different materials freeze. The soot line, for example, is much closer to the star. So, if a planet forms closer to the star than the soot or ice lines, it will be made only of rocky material. If a planet forms beyond the soot line, but closer to its star than the ice line, it will be a dry soot planet made of rocky and carbonaceous material. If a planet forms beyond the ice line, then it will be a soot water planet made of water, rock, and carbon material. But as you can see, there isn't really a place where you get just rock and water, without also getting a large amount of carbon. However, that doesn't mean you can't get an ocean planet. It just means most of the ocean plants we see may also have huge amounts of carbon, which will be important for habitability. But it does also mean you can get plants with layers of diamond or graphite, which is pretty interesting. Methane, for example, becomes a diamond at a heat and pressure that should be readily available in many Neptune planets, meaning these planets could have large amounts of diamond. At first, more carbon may actually seem like a good thing for life. Life is carbon-based, so having a whole bunch of organic compounds may hypothetically make it easier for life to start. These planets could have very methane-rich atmospheres, which some theories suggest may be a requirement for life to start. However, it may also be a very bad thing. As mentioned earlier, these planets could have large amounts of diamond. Unfortunately, diamond is a very strong material, and combined with a mantle of rocky material, it could greatly increase the viscosity and thermal conductivity of the planet's mantle, leading to uninhabitable surface conditions if the planet even has a surface. A planetary core with a large amount of carbon may also not be able to generate a strong magnetic field, though many Neptunes may have other ways to do that. So in summary, many planets we think are ocean worlds might actually be soot planets, made of large amounts of carbon rather than water. Dry soot planets can explain the low densities of many mini Neptunes without the need for water oceans. Alternatively, the planets may be made of a mix of both soot and water, though it seems like planets made of just rock and water, which is the ocean planet model you're probably familiar with, don't seem that likely. This has big consequences for the habitability of ocean planets. It may make it easier for life to form, but it also may lead to very different, potentially uninhabitable surface conditions. As a different internal composition leads to different types of volcanic activity, but these planets may have a lot of diamonds, which is pretty cool. But so far, this has all been speculation. Are there any specific planets we know that could be soot planets? For this, we'll look at three mini-Neptunes, TOI-270d, K218b, and Nipotia. TOI-270d is about 4.2 times more massive than Earth, 2.1 times wider, and takes about 11.3 days to orbit its red dwarf star. It's the outermost of three known planets in its system, and the second largest after TOI-270c. James Webb has observed this planet, confirming that it does have an atmosphere, and that atmosphere has a high metallicity, meaning a large amount of it is made of materials other than hydrogen and helium. Some detected chemicals include methane, something we expect in soot planets, as well as carbon dioxide and water vapor. However, it's too close to its star to be in the habitable zone. But of the three planets in this video, TOI-270d is the most likely to be a soot planet. It has a high carbon to oxygen ratio, and has plentiful methane and carbon dioxide, which is to be expected if it has a large amount of carbon. James Webb observations are also consistent with this planet being a soot planet, not confirming it, but also not ruling it out. However, the amount of carbon this planet has is dependent on the metallicity of its atmosphere. If its metallicity is similar to the metallicity of the sun, any amount of carbon explains the observations, and its atmosphere must be less than 0.4% the mass of the planet, meaning most of it is made of rocky solid material. If it has 100 times the atmospheric metallicity of the sun, any amount of carbon works, but its atmosphere must be less than 10% the total mass of the planet, starting to make it closer to a mini Neptune than a rocky planet. A 2024 observation of the planet claimed to have found a metallicity about 224 times greater than the Sun, which is close enough to be consistent with the 100 times metallicity scenario. So, TOI-270d is likely to be a soot planet instead of a water world, which has been proposed, and made of a lot of rocky and carbonaceous material, but also likely with an extremely dense atmosphere, potentially making up to 10% the mass of the entire planet. Next up, K218b. This planet is about double the mass of TOI-270d, 8.6 Earths, 2.6 times wider than Earth, and takes about 33 days to orbit its red dwarf star. Like the last planet, K218b has been confirmed to have an atmosphere by James Webb. 
It's also the outermost and largest known planet of its system, bigger than the five Earth mass K218c. It's also in the star's habitable zone, where temperatures are right for liquid water to exist. I have a whole video about K218b, but just to clear it up right now, there are no promising signs of life on this planet, and there are no promising signs of an ocean either. Anyways, K218b's atmosphere has been found to contain carbon dioxide and methane, with maybe some water vapor as well, and its atmosphere makes up at most 6.2% the mass of the planet. Like TOI-270d, James Webb observations are consistent with K218b being a soot planet, not confirming it or ruling it out. However, it's less likely than TOI-270d, as additional sources of carbon would need to be detected to make this scenario more likely. Unlike TOI-270d, which seems to be almost certainly at least be consistent with being a soot planet, K218b will need more observations to fully confirm or rule it out. For more information about this planet, check out my full video about K218b. Anyways, the last planet is GJ1214b, officially named Anipotia. It's the only planet in this video with an official name, and as already mentioned, its name literally translates to large body of water. So it would be pretty ironic if Anipotia turned out to be a soot planet. Anipotia is similar in size to K218b, 8.4 Earth masses and 2.7 times wider than Earth. It has a much shorter orbital period than either planet so far, taking just 1.5 days to orbit its red dwarf star Orcaria. Like the other two, it has been studied by James Webb and confirmed to have an atmosphere, and even has a temperature measurement with a measured dayside temperature of 536 degrees Fahrenheit or 280 Celsius. Not very habitable temperatures, but it could still potentially have a lot of water and be a cool type of steam planet. Of course, assuming it's not a soot planet. Luckily, that seems to be the case for Anipotia. The study that talks about the other two planets rules out a carbon-rich atmosphere for this planet, making it likely to not be a soot planet. Like the other two, a large amount of carbon is possible if it has an atmospheric metallicity similar to the Sun's or 100 times greater than the Sun's. However, this is not true. Anipotia's atmosphere is at least 1,000 times more metal-rich than the Sun's, with some proposing its metallicity is as high as 3,000 times the solar metallicity. If this number is true, it rules out a carbon-rich composition for Anipotia. However, that may not be entirely confirmed. If the planet's interior metallicity is different than its atmospheres, for example, that may complicate things. If an Anipotia's atmosphere is secondary, meaning it formed after the planet itself formed, it would provide strong evidence that the metallicity of the atmosphere is different than the interior, meaning the claim that it's not a soot planet would need to be reassessed. However, a 2022 observation detected controversial evidence of escaping helium from the planet. If that is confirmed, then it would also confirm that Anipotia's atmosphere is primordial, not secondary, providing strong evidence that it's not a soot planet. So, Anipotia is likely to not be a soot planet, though it may be if its atmosphere is secondary instead of primordial. However, there is weak evidence that its atmosphere is primordial, which could make it the only planet in this video that isn't made of a lot of carbonaceous material. So maybe there is still hope for non-soot ocean planets to exist in the universe. Of course, not having carbon doesn't mean Anipotia is a hot ocean planet. Recent observations cast doubt on Anipotia being an ocean planet, suggesting instead a very large super Venus, for example. So to answer the question in the title of this video, it does seem likely that a large majority of planets we think of as ocean planets may in fact be soot planets. However, soot planets covered in oceans can exist, and the two terms aren't mutually exclusive. Either way, our model of rock and water explaining the low density of many Neptunes may need to be reevaluated. Ocean worlds seem to be a lot more complicated than initially thought, and now we have to contend with things like layers of diamond and methane-dominated atmospheres when considering what these planets may be like. And the only way to find out what's actually going on is to study more mini-Neptunes. I've already mentioned Kepler-22b and LHS-1140b, but there are hundreds more we could look at to definitively see how common or uncommon soot planets are. So far we have formation models, one likely soot planet, one potential soot planet, and one mini-Neptune that's probably not a soot planet. But three planets isn't enough to make any conclusions yet, and to confirm any of this we simply have to go and study some more mini-Neptunes. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about exoplanets and space exploration.